was head of department as I Da sind nicht die Gesetze drin und deshalb brauche ich das immer. Actually, we all are operating from our respective homes. So sometimes there's a problem of connectivity also, sir. Okay. All right. What about uh, your, your college is closed completely now? Yeah, it's closed, sir. It's closed. Okay. Our, my college, yeah, my college is completely closed and we are operating uh, from our home. And uh, we are offering, yeah, we are offering online lectures. All right. All right. All right. And you are teaching space law, no? No, no, international law, sir. <laughs> okay, very and good. I would really, and I would, I would really, you know, want you to come someday to Nagaland. And uh, we would really love to welcome you, sir. Have you ever been to this side, Northeast India? No, no, not unfortunately not. I want to see Kolkata very much, I must say. I've never seen it and I haven't visited your college, so... There will come a time, I'm certain, you know, that, that I will come to you as well. Oh, sure, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, so our uh, HOD sir is there. And uh, we, will, we will start now. Uh, Dr. Rimmel, yeah, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we are going to start now. Just in a moment. Yes, I'm right here. I'm right here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We're waiting for you. Okay, so let us begin. Shall I start? Uh, sir, uh, let me, let me, just, let, me let me just give, give you your official introduction, you know, and then our HOD will officially welcome you, and then we will start, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I didn't know. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, sir. All right. So... Welcome all of you to this uh, international webinar. Today's topic is going to be very interesting. Many years ago, the British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked, why did he want to climb it? He said, because it is there. Well, space is there, and we are going to climb it, and the moon and the planets are there, and the new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. Yes, the space is there. Humanity has been sharing a curiosity about the space since time immemorial. For thousands and thousands of years, we have been dreaming about the space. We have been thinking about the space. We have been attempting to reach out to the space. But finally, we succeed. When Neil Armstrong set its foot on the moon, that was a moment of joy, satisfaction, happiness, but also was a moment of responsibility that mankind has encountered. So that small step of mankind, that small step of Neil Armstrong taught us so many things. It was Yuri Gagarin, it was Neil Armstrong, and from Neil Armstrong till now, we are now dreaming to go to the Mars. We are going to beyond the Mars. We are entering into interstellar space, and we are dreaming to go beyond. However, the one important factor that we need to consider is a legal aspect involved in the space exploration. As I often say to my students that Nothing can be separated from law. Law will always be with you, right from your birth till your last breath. Every activity, every movement, every breath you take, every word you utter, every move you make, everything will be governed by the law. So this space exploration cannot be an ex exception at all. However, it's a relatively a very new area, you know, the law is still in the process of development, as I was just discussing with uh, Professor Hobe. And therefore, uh, it is very important to have a discussion on this uh, very important topic concerning uh, the space law. I teach international law to my students at uh, MA level, MA political science, 
as well as uh, at sixth sixth semester. And in their syllabus, uh, there is a part which is dedicated to the space law also. And I'm sure my students will benefit from this lecture. My friends will benefit from the lecture. And the most important aspect that I want to want to discuss with you is the possibility of ideas, the sharing of ideas. And this is how I see uh, this particular lecture. So uh, to talk on to talk about the space law and various aspects related to it, uh, we have a very special guest today, and he is uh, Professor Dr. H. C. Stephen Hobe who is the director of the Institute of Air Law, Space Law, and Cyber Law, as well as co-director of the International Investment Law Center, Cologne. He is a member of various scientific associations, inter alia the vice president of the German Society of International Law. His scientific or encompasses three books on public international law, European law, and space law, as well as editorship, uh, as well as editorship and 350 articles on German public law, public international law, international investment law, air law, space law, and cyber law. He teaches as a guest faculty at various universities in Europe, Africa, and Asia. When it comes to the position that he has held, uh, he is uh, at the International Institute of Space for Board of Directors, International Academy of Astronautics, he is a full member, International Law Association of Space Law Committee, European Center for Space Law Board of Directors, International Chamber of Commerce, Commission, German Society of International Law, ILA German Branch, member of the advisory board, German Association of International Law, ILA German Branch Treasurer, European Air Law Association, member of the Committee of Management, American Society of International Law, is a member of it. Uh, he's going to discuss with us about about the threats to the outer space environment, the dangers of space debris, legal consideration. This is a hotly debated topic uh, at this point of time all over the world, in academia as well as uh, in the policy sectors. More than 50 years of space flight since Sputnik 1 on 4th October 1957 have left many usable orbits full of junk. Parts of rockets and fuel as well as other particles threaten space objects tremendously since they fly at a very high velocity and can thus destroy even functional space objects like satellites. Shielding of space objects against space junk bigger than one centimeter is possible. Again, this background, first the international legal order for human space activities will be looked into in order to find out whether there are provisions designed for the protection of outer space and the celestial bodies. Moreover, new legally non-binding so-called space debris mitigation guidelines will be presented that aim at protection in a however imperfect way. Finally, the question will be asked whether and for whom there is a legal duty to clean up outer space from the space debris particle. So before I invite uh, Professor Stephen Hobe to take a charge of the stage, I request uh, head of the Department of Political Science, Dr. Rinmay Longmay, to kindly welcome, sir. Dr. Rinmay Longmay, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ani. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, sir. You're audible. Hello. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ani, and uh, for giving me this uh, time to welcome our special guests uh, for today's lecture. Uh, just to inform our, you know, honorable speaker, sir, um, here at that, so uh, we used to organize a series of, uh, you know, uh, webinar, you know, uh, do, during this uh, this uh, pandemic. Uh, period and uh, we touched upon various issues uh, uh, <clears throat> which are uh, in fact uh, emerging issues uh, in nature. So today sir, we are indeed very happy to have you uh, uh, on our floor to talk about you know uh, problems uh, at the outer space. So um, Dr. Ani has already informed you know um, Every one of us here in our college, uh, especially you know the faculties of the Department of Political Science, and we are happy to learn that you know such an international figure, you yourself, is coming over you know to our platform and going to deliver you know, a special talk on 
you know, uh, a rare, you know, uh, topics, you know, uh, many people, you know, hardly <coughs> take up such a topic. So we are very fortunate, in fact, you know, to talk about, uh, you know, today's, you know, uh, topic with you, sir. And uh, we are really, uh, we are looking forward to hearing from you. And uh, as Dr. Ani, our moderator, has already mentioned, you know, as part of our syllabus, we, we talk about international, you know, we teach international law to our students. And um, we are, you know, talking about, you know, laws of the seas and laws of the space. And today, this is a great, you know, uh, 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 opportunities for both the teachers and students of the department to learn together from uh, from you, and therefore we are looking forward to hear from you. And then uh, I hope that towards the end of the session, during the Q and A session, I believe that uh, many of us will be, you know, um, asking to know, you know, more things from you. And we are looking forward to that uh, session as well. So thank you very much. And I, on behalf of the entire, you know, Texo College Political Science family, I heartily welcome you once again. Uh, on behalf of our department and on the on on my own behalf. Thank you very much, sir. Over to Ani. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Rime Longman. Uh, sir, now I request you to kindly uh, take a charge and uh, I request you to kindly share your thoughts with all of us. We are really eager to learn from you. Thank you so much. Sir. Ich hätte rausgehen müssen, glaube ich. Ich muss mit Teil gehen. Wie komme ich denn jetzt da rein? Ja, genau. Can you see it? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. Sorry, I had some problems. And you can hear me as well? Sure, sir. Loud and clear. Okay, thank you very much for your very kind introduction, Mr. Head of Department and yourself. Um, it is for me a, a very great pleasure, indeed, um, to and an honor, of course, to have the opportunity to teach to you on the matter of space law. Myself, I'm, so to speak, a born international lawyer, but relatively soon uh, I got, when writing my PhD thesis, I got into space law, and ever since I'm fascinated by that subject. And uh, the more the years go, the more movement we see. Because at the beginning, it was just governments that were doing space, uh, space affairs, space activities. And now we have more and more private activities like SpaceX with Elon Musk and other great individuals who are doing things that may go into four, five, 10, 20, 30 years. You, you mentioned via the moon towards Mars. 
or even beyond, and that may give and open unique chances for space transportation throughout the space. Nobody thinks about these things. We talk a little bit about touristic activities, but it may go on, and uh, what people don't think about at the moment may become possible in the future. Let's think great, and let's see that this may, in fact, be an opportunity. But for this being possible, for this being developed in the future, we need a space environment that is free from toxic situations that we have at the moment. And my lecture today, entitled Protection of the Environment of Outer Space, the Danger of Space Debris Legal Considerations, will deal with these problems and will deal with um, what mankind has done and what the legal profession has done so far in order to keep the environment and find legal rules for keeping the environment proper. What we can, well, I may start with some things that are not familiar to all of you. We have five international agreements, five international agreements in outer space. So that is um, uh, international law, international treaties that currently determine human activities in outer space. The most important one being the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, then the Registration Convention, the Rescue Agreement, the Liability Convention, and finally the Moon Agreement. And in these international agreements, you find more or less the important provisions that determine the respective behavior. But as we will see very soon, when international legislation came into, into place that started in the 1960s and the Outer Space Treaties of 1967, this was before mankind really was concerned so much about environmental protection, because this really started off in the 1970s. 1972 was the big Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment, and after that, we had international environmental law, but not in 1967. So we have to diagnose that international space law kind of lacks specific provisions that deal with the cleaning of outer space. And we will see in this lecture what the international community has done instead in order to get along with this problem. We have a provision in Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty, the first provision of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which kind of says, the exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interest of all countries, irrespective of their degree of economic or scientific development, and shall be the province of all mankind. This provision indeed does not specifically mention the clean environment, but with a little bit of interpretative creativity, you can say if outer space shall be the province of all mankind, it is considered, as you can see in Article 2, as sub no, not subject of national appropriation, no sovereignty is allowed. All states possess and uh, um, have the property on outer space. It's an international common space and all countries, be they small or big, be they developing countries or be they highly developed countries, shall have a possibility to use it. And if you interpret this Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty in its first paragraph in that way, you may say then you may have at least an intrinsic obligation to leave outer space clean and to take measures, first of all, to prevent 
outer space from being um, kind of made uh, full of, uh, of waste, and secondly, do something about existing waste and outer space. You know, therefore, I think with a little bit of interpretative creativity, you can actually say, yes, indeed, outer space law deals with the um, with the general obligation to do something for the environment. But, as you all know, because you're lawyers, this is a very general obligation. It's not a specific obligation that kind of, you know, obliges country X or Y or Z or enterprise X, Y, Z to actually do something in order to clean out the space. Therefore, it's nice to have, but not really very helpful. Moreover, we have another agreement, the Moon Agreement of 1979, which in its Article 7 says, in exploring and using the Moon, states, parties shall take measures to prevent the disruption of the existing balance of its environment, whether by introducing adverse changes in that environment, by its harmful contamination through the introduction of extra environmental matter, or otherwise. States, parties shall also take measures to avoid harmfully affecting the environment of the Earth through the introduction of extraterrestrial matter, or otherwise. So you see, this is a more precise language but first of all, it just deals with the moon and other celestial bodies. That means moon, Mars, Saturn, and what you have on those planets around the Earth or around the Sun, to be more precise. And it kind of is also a bit falling short of a precise obligation. Article 4, paragraph 1 of the Moon Agreement reads, the exploration and use of the moon shall be the province of all mankind and shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interests of all countries, irrespective of the degree of economic or scientific development. Due regard shall be paid to the interests of present and future generations, as well as to the need to promote higher standards of living and conditions of economic and social progress and development in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations. So you see there very precisely that the Moon Agreement at least does something more concrete, but in my opinion is not concrete enough. Moreover, the Moon Agreement has been ratified only by 18 countries. This is not even a tenth of the international community, and therefore the value of the Moon Agreement is rather limited. Then we have one article in the Outer Space Treaty, namely Article 9, which in its four sentences is something close to a provision on environmental protection. It's a very long provision, so I'll read only the first sentences to you. In the exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, States parties to the treaty shall be guided by the principle of cooperation and mutual assistance and shall conduct all their activities in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, with due regard to the corresponding interests of all other states parties to the treaty. So there shall be given due regard to the corresponding interests of all other states parties to the treaty. This is important, but it is not very precise. What does that mean? You may use outer space. You may excave, let's say, minerals from Mars or from the moon. And what shall you do? You regard to the corresponding interest of all other countries. So you may say you shall be careful but is this really precisely that what you shall do? I am not certain, and I think 
for a lawyer, this is not strict enough. Moreover, the second sentence says parties to the treaty shall pursue studies in out of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, and conduct exploration of them so as to avoid their harmful contamination, also adverse changes in the environment of the Earth, resulting from the introduction of extraterrestrial matter and, when necessary, shall adopt appropriate measures for that purpose. So this is very general. This is not very precise. We have the same dilemma as we had before, also with regard to Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty, and the third and fourth sentence of Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty, again the same. We have then some other conventions that do not directly deal with outer space, but that may be introduced into space legislation through Article 3 of the Outer Space Treaty, because Article 3 of the Outer Space Treaty allows to implant other provisions. The NMOD Convention, that is called the Environmental Modification Convention of 1976, says each state party to this convention undertakes not to engage in military or any other hostile use of environmental modification techniques having widespread, long-lasting or severe effects as the means of destruction, damage or injury to any other state party. Entirely unclear whether we can use it. What we can perhaps use, and this is now a proposition I have to make, is that there are some customary law principles or some principles of international environmental law, not specifically addressed to space, but to be transferred to space via Article 3 of the Outer Space Treaty, which reads, as you can see in the bottom line, states parties to the treaty shall carry on activities in the exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, in accordance with international law, including the Charter of the United Nations, the interest of maintaining international peace and security and promoting international cooperation and understanding. This provision basically says, and there is unanimity, outer space law is part of general international law. Therefore, provisions of interna general international law can be applied in outer space as well via Article 3 of the Outer Space Treaty. But they must inter alia then be principles of environmental customary international law. The principle of sustainable development, for example, the principle of intergenerational equity, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, the principle of equitable use of natural resources. The most important principle is, uh, of course, the polluter pays principle, saying that the one that have caused a pollution must care for its eradication or pay for damages. It is, however, unclear in international law how many of these general principles have already acquired the legal status of customary international law. So therefore, we must be reluctant and I'm rather hesitant to accept those as really principles of customary international law. When and in what phases of space endeavors can now be there a danger? And what is the typical danger for a space mission? The danger exists in that mankind now, since 1957, Sputnik 1, has launched space objects like satellites into outer space. And for one reason or the other, these space objects were not fabricated in a way that they were safe 
but there were little split offs of color of some, let's say, antennas or parts of an antenna, uh, part of metal. Um, so, and if this as such is something that you say, well, it just happens. Yes, it just happens, but there is an imminent danger. And the danger is that the velocity in outer space is very, very high. I come to the exact speed in a minute. It's very, very high, and through these relatively high velocities, even small pieces are very dangerous weapons. If you can shoot with a small piece of space, we say space debris, these are these you know, rock pieces, then you can destroy, for example, a satellite. That can happen maybe in the pre-launch phase, where you have to take care of the, the, the manufacturer, particularly in the launch phase where you have toxic components and the post-launch phase. So in all phases, you can have that. Where can dangers exist? They can exist on the Earth, in the atmosphere, and outer space. During normal operations, a failure in international behavior can also be um, be, uh, be uh, let's say responsible for that if for example through the willful shooting the willful shooting of a weapon into outer space the destruction of a satellite these things are called anti-satellite weapons and they are deliberately done in order to destroy in order to destroy space objects, uh, in order to test these weapons that they are really safe. This can, and of course this then causes great, great parts of space debris, millions of pieces of space debris. If you therefore look and compare the outer space environment, 1957, 2005, I refer to the to the uh, you know the, the ranking right hand side 2018 and then the forecast for 2030 you see there is an imminent danger currently as you can see on the left hand side we uh, may have an estimated 150 million man made small objects bigger than 1 millimeter an estimated 700,000 objects between 1 and 10 centimeters, more than 21,000 objects bigger than 10 centimeters, and if the impact velocity is 10 kilometers per second, you must multiply this by 3,600 in order to get the hourly speed, and then you will have some ideas, 36,000 kilometers per hour, this means that there is a very, very high impact velocity. We have approximately 1,000 active satellites. Here you can see, for example, what the deliberate destruction of a Chinese satellite to the anti-satellite weapon of Feng Yong one c has brought what acceleration of the number of debris. Later, there was a collision between two satellites, a non-functioning Iridium-33 satellite and a Cosmos satellite, Cosmos 2251, that gave much less numbers of debris. Almost all pieces of debris in the geostationary orbit and in the low Earth orbit, geostationary orbit is about 36,000 kilometers above sea level, low Earth orbit is several hundred kilometers above uh, sea level. They are cataloged by Russian surveillance and American surveillance, so it is pretty obvious where we have these things. If we now see what's the risk, the risk of collision in Earth orbit is 
between debris pieces makes even more debris. Between man, functional objects and debris can be very dangerous. Between man, functional objects, an impact velocity with a one millimeter object brings a degradation some object that is bigger than one centimeter brings a potentially catastrophic loss. And between one and 10 centimeters, uh, it is, these are so-called deadly objects. So you can see the farmer with an old satellite or the International Space Station with a hole in the, uh, in the outside uh, furniture. So you see anything bigger than one centimeter is able to destroy even intact big satellites. Now, this is the danger. So what can we do? Can we do little? Who has to do something? How can we do something? There is a first lecture learned. Because the situation is very difficult and the likelihood of collisions is relatively high, it's the first and primary objective to try to prevent or minimize the risk of the development of debris. One tries to make any generation of space debris illegal. It is probably not, but if there would be legislation saying, try to avoid the generation of, of space debris, then we might come at the end of the day to some prohibition of the generation of space debris. Is there an obligation to prevent or at least to minimize the generation of space debris? Questionable. Is there an obligation to prevent or at least minimize the risk related to space debris? Questionable. Is there a, an obligation to collision avoidance? in particular exchange of data and maneuvering? Probably yes. What about space traffic management? Do we have something? Do we have space traffic rules in outer space? Not really yet. What about the legality and the duty of removal and recycling of space debris? What about an allocation of financial burden and the transfer of technology? Questionable. My immediate summary is, in principle, states are under the obligation to ensure that activities within their jurisdiction and control do not cause damage, and to respect the environment of outer space or of areas beyond their jurisdiction and control. Such has been confirmed by the International Court of Justice to be part of customary international law and is also enlisted in Article 3 of the IOC draft articles on the prevention of transboundary harm from hazardous activities of 2001. These can be applied to outer space. There is a due regard principle and duty to avoid harmful contamination, as we can see in Article 9. There is a global public and community interest in outer space. Article 1 and 2. There's an interrelation with general international law by operation of Article 3. There is an absolute minimum that states obligation to prevent and minimize risk related to space debris. That is, the minimum obligation is states shall try to prevent and minimize risks related to space debris. But there is, on the other hand, a lack of concrete binding rules reflecting the appropriate means and the exercise of due diligence during the conduct of space activities. Space debris 
is a complex, multidimensional problem with safety concerns, security concerns, economical interest, financial burdens, and liability as well as ethics. And it needs an operational framework. Now a very interesting thing started to develop. There was a working group established by space agencies called, that met together for the first time 27 years ago, as Interagency Debris Committee, IADC. So it's not a formal space conference. It is an informal meeting in the Interagency Debris Committee. And this debris committee introduced the question of space debris on, in, on the agenda of the scientific and technical subcommittee. There are two, the, the outer space committee with two subcommittees, the technical and the legal subcommittee. In 2002, the IADC, the Interagency Debris Committee, tabled for the first time space debris mitigation guidelines. Listen again, space debris mitigation guidelines for the avoidance of space debris that was updated in 2007. We have still discussions going on mainly in the space debris, in the, sorry, in the, in the scientific and technical subcommittee much less in the legal subcommittee because, of course, some countries are afraid of drawing concrete consequences from the fact that outer space and the most populated um, 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 orbits are full of debris. What do the space debris mitigation guidelines have as a context. They define space debris as all man-made objects, including fragments and elements that are in Earth orbit or re-entering the atmosphere that are non-functional. Non-functional small objects man-made. The space debris mitigation guidelines are applicable to missions planning in the operation of newly designed spacecraft and orbital stages. So mission planning, it is before a concrete satellite has been launched. The scope is the UN guidelines do not outlaw a certain type of space activity. The UN guidelines provide guidance on how to conduct space activities in principle in order to prevent or at least to minimize harmful byproducts of space activities. And the UN guidelines do not address remediation, space traffic management, and global space situational awareness. Of particular importance is remediation. That means the cleaning up from existing pieces of debris. I come to this at the very end of my speech. So we take that currently we have non-binding guidelines, which I will present to you in a minute, that ask humankind and those who use outer space in specific orbits to use it with space objects that are safe and that cannot split off and uh, try to get it safely off the orbit after the end of its lifetime. It's just the mitigation, the avoidance of space debris. It does not say something about the cleaning up. And legally speaking, these are two different coins of one metal. Now, these are the seven space debris mitigation guidelines. The first says, limit the debris released during normal operations. Space systems should be designed not to release debris during normal operations. 
to prevent the production of space debris even when undertaken space activities that are perfectly legal in general. If this is not feasible, the effect of any release of debris on outer space environment should be minimized. If the release cannot be prevented in its entirety, the effects are to be minimized. So, try to minimize the danger. Try to minimize the coming into existence of space debris through fragmentation. Then, second, minimize the potential for breakups during operational phases. For example, get your satellite into another orbit, make it on the passive stage. In order, we call this a graveyard orbit that is kind of, you know, gives no danger of collision anymore. Third, limit the probability of accidental collisions in orbit. So take it of the most frequented orbits. Four, avoid intentional destruction and other harmful activities. The intentional destruction is what I've just said for criminal, for, sorry, military uses that you intentionally destroy your satellite in order to test your anti-satellite weapon. Shouldn't do that. Although it is still legal, minimize potential for post-mission breakups relighting, resulting from stored energy. Limit the long-term presence of spacecraft and launch vehicle orbital stages in the low Earth orbit region after the end of their mission. And finally, limit the long-term interference of spacecraft and launch vehicle over the stages with the geosynchronous Earth orbit region after the end of their mission. So from the very early time of preparation of the mission through the fabrication of the space object, until the very end of the mission in the graveyard orbit or the sink and passing through the re-entry of the Earth atmosphere, all parts of a space mission shall be planned in such a way as, a, as to avoid the generation of space debris. Is that possible? Yes, it is possible. Space debris mitigation is therefore possible. Try it with uttermost care. What, what about the junk that is up there? First of all, there are methods to actually bring it down. Bring it down through, let's say, the tethering. You see that in the first picture, the tethering, the capture of debris using throw nets or harpoons. Contactless technologies of iron, iron beaming and solid propulsion or sail-based deorbiting. You see, these three possibilities do exist and it should be a very worthwhile effort to concentrate your business on the cleaning up of specific orbits from existing pieces of debris. But what about the legal situation? What about the legal problem? Is there an international obligation to actively remove space debris? I think it's doubtful. How is to be decided whether a spacecraft is of value? Third, is it allowed to remove objects of other space actors? You, you think, well, this space object, this satellite is of danger. Can I just take it that it is not mine? Then removal without consent is probably not allowed, as Article 8 of the Outer Space Treaty says. The consent of the launching state is needed. What if the state or registry is unidentifiable? The conflict between jurisdiction and freedom of use of others. 
and the self-help in case of necessity. What about the jurisdiction to the principle of sustainability? So we have a lot of difficult legal questions that does, do not make it safe at the moment whether we can have a duty to remove existing space debris. I summarize. The greatest problem for space travel, which will augment in the future because of the privatization of certain space activities, and give the opportunity of space transportation, that means uh, transportation into outer space, transportation through outer space, and transportation from outer space back to the Earth. This new era is, is likely to be endangered by tiny pieces of space debris. Um, the size is already pretty high, but the, the outer space is also very high. But in the most important orbits, we have a considerable number of debris, and we have a debris of a certain size, bigger than one centimeter, that can be deadly for intact space objects like satellites. Therefore, one must think of preventive measures on the one hand to fabricate space objects in a very safe and robust way, in order to avoid the generation of space debris. And we must have guidelines in order to avoid the generation of space debris, avoid the collision in orbit, bring this fun satellite safely either in a graveyard orbit or bring them back to the Earth, to the Earth atmosphere, catch them with respective catching nets or harpoon them. So there are technologies, but it is unclear whether there is already a duty, a legal duty for remediation. This also depends very much on whether we can implement the polluter pays principle. Very difficult with regard to tiny pieces of space to be the, 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 the polluter pays principle in outer space. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope that you got an impression of our problems in outer space. And I'm happy if you found this of some interest. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hove, for your enlightening presentation. It was re really a wonderful experience for all of us. Let me just inform you that uh, this topic is uh, completely new uh, in this part of the world, in this part of uh, India as well. And uh, we have been speaking about uh, the environmental concerns on the Earth. But when yeah. it comes to the question of the space, the situation entirely changes. Uh, when it comes to the legal complications, when it comes to the silence of the law, when it comes to policy measures, uh, we somewhere feel that uh, there is so much needs to be done on various fronts. So uh, with these words, I thank you so much. So let us uh, take some questions. So a couple of questions are waiting for us, uh, Professor Hobe. So uh, first question is coming from uh, Ms. Priyanka Jaule. And uh, she is asking, is there any possibility to measure damage done by space debris? so that it will help to calculate liability under polluter pays principle. So her question is revolving around a polluter pays principle. So what is your take on it, Professor? Well, to measure damage, yes. I mean, in case a satellite is defunct, you can say it costs the renewal of the satellite. And the satellite can cost, you may have an idea, between 7 and 15 million euro or let's say 15 million dollars so that's a lot of money small pieces can do have big effects and therefore we must come to something that is i think the most important point that i was not talking about today that we have traffic rules for outer space that everybody knows precisely 
were to go and uh, were not to go. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Ms. Priyanka is asking another question as well. And uh, her second question is, what regulations you think will be helpful to monitor private sector activities and make them accountable? A very sensitive question. Uh, in case of uh, Government India's policy also to invite private sector players in the space industry. So I think this question is very valid. Thank you very much for this very good question. I mean, um, the Outer Space Treaty itself in Article 6 recognizes the permissibility of private actors being active in outer space and using outer space. But only under the condition that they are under the close observation of a launching state, of a state that is that takes up responsibility. Therefore, for any developed country um, who uh, considers to be a space nation, a, a, an international, no, a national space law is required where you have detailed the requirements for the launching of a satellite, particularly you need an insurance in order to prevent the country that can be held responsible after damage um, to give this country the possibility to have recourse against your insurer. So it is up to the country to regulate in its national space law these respective uh, regulations uh, and the requirements for private space launching. Uh, sir, just to uh, just to further this discussion, uh, I have a question that uh, in the absence of national legislation, okay, and we, we know very well that uh, what is the status of space law in India or any other country overall at international level. So when it comes to uh, the absence of uh, policy measures, when it comes to the absence of specific national law, then how to level the responsibility? Now, see, SpaceX, uh, SpaceX is uh, really minting money, you know, they are they are, uh, you know, exploring space. They are. They, they have done number of launches also. So how do we level the responsibility? I mean, I'm not sure about what uh, American government, uh, you know, share a kind of uh, legal uh, relationship with them. But is there any law present in America that would keep a check and balance on the activities of SpaceX uh, with reference to the environmental protection of the space? First of all, the United States has also national space laws. All right. The problem, yes, they do have, and of course, SpaceX gets a permission from the American Launching Authority, FAA, before launching these things. The, re the, re the precise requirements, I don't know. Whether and, and how far um, questions of uh, environmental protection uh, are taken into consideration i have no idea um so i will i cannot answer that but in principle yes there is national space legislation and this is necessary because under international space law it's always the launching state as you can see in the liability convention always the launching state that is liable for damage Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, let us take a uh, next question from uh, Rajasi Guha Roy. So the question is, uh, sir, can you can use of artificial intelligence and machine learning be generated to solve space debris problem? Use of artificial intelligence and machine learning be generated to solve space debris problem. Something to do with technology. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very good question. I believe yes, in two, on two accounts. First of all, in the pay process of manufacturing space objects like satellites, I think uh, artificial intelligence can kind of heighten the quality of the fabrication. And secondly, in the process of cleaning up orbits, Probably technology can help as well in order to discover pieces of space debris. Um, these are guesses. The first is no guess. The second is a guess. But I think this could be, in fact, possible. And uh, we see really how much this very high-tech 
branch is depending on the progress of technology. Thank you, sir. Uh, but do you have any idea about uh, what is the present situation? Because uh, especially when it comes to the question of, uh, you know, a relationship between artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning, uh, it is a hypothesis, I believe. They have not yet reached to that stage uh, in the technology because still, you know, the Earth orbit, the usable orbits is still stuffed with uh, serious uh, particles of space debris. So I think it is a, a hypothesis, but yes, it is going to be helpful in the future. But how do we see yep. the threat? How do we see the threat in the present time? You know, sir, what, what you must understand is the following. Technology will be ready, probably with the help of artificial, artificial intelligence to clean up. Right. But the costs are so immense that nobody, no exactly. state, no private enterprise is interested at all to tackle this problem. Everybody does as this problem would not exist, would not be pertinent, would not be urgent. It is urgent, but nobody wants to touch it because it is so highly expensive. So in my idea here, it would only be possible to later on come with some very innovative idea of founding a fund in which countries that launch satellites must pay in. And that actually uh, deal uh, has the purpose of reimbursing from paying damages. Very possible, sir. very possible. Thank you. Let us move to uh, the next question. The question is coming from Rishita Singh. Rishita Singh, Uh, so, as United Nations guideline doesn't talk about cleaning up, but what can we do to stop, minimize future filling up of this kind of waste? So, this is a question from Vishesh Singh. I apologize for my internet connection. So, your yes. Take. Could you briefly repeat the question? I didn't get everything. Uh, you know. Oh, sir. Yes. So, question is: According to recent studies, there is 200 tons of Earth waste later on our moon. Most of them are west of spacecrafts, voyagers, and even plastic bags. As United Nations guideline doesn't talk about cleaning up, but what can we do to stop, minimize future piling up of this kind of waste, especially in the context of our dreaming to uh, conquest uh, the Mars? Thank you, thank you. I mean, I mean, the 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 the, the points. The first of all, the problem must be addressed. Secondly. In the process of fabrication, the mitigation guidelines ask for a better technology to fabricate space objects. Third, of course, it is an absolute no-go, and I'm not aware, for example, that any junk is thrown away from the International Space Station, which is a permanent station in outer space so far. So... Um, I think the, uh, the increasing technology will enable to be better uh, with regard to the generation of space debris, but it will take some time. Right, sir. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, in this context, uh, you know, there is uh, some a different type of question has come from uh, Mr. Arsh Chaturvedi. He say, he's asking that in the era where we are moving towards space war, does countries are really ready to talk about the cleanup? On one hand, we are speaking about using uh, us usable space orbits for military purposes. We are thinking about the space law. There have been talks going on. So in this context of highly volatile international political environment, is it really, uh, is it really uh, uh, you know, wise or are countries really ready to talk about space environment, space cleanup? What is your take on it, sir? Thank you. Well... Whether it's wise or not, I cannot judge. I think it's simply necessary because everybody, as Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty and Article 2 say, everybody, everybody is proprietor of outer space and the celestial bodies. And everybody 
and we know how useful, for example, the use of outer space for telecommunication purposes is. We get TV from outer space. We get some other mobile uh, possibilities from outer space. So if this is all not possible anymore, that would be detrimental for mankind. And therefore, um, I think it's more a matter of logic um, and of money, of course, that we must continue with these efforts. Right, sir. Thank you so much. However, uh, when the question of, uh, you know, the space environment comes, another question comes about at the, par at the parallel level, the another question might rise about uh, the dreams about dreams of man, okay, to explore the space, right? On one hand, it is technology. On the other hand, it is uh, environmental concern. And uh, on the earth also, right, we have experienced that, uh, you know, sometimes people prefer to look away when the question of progress and development comes. Right. So therefore, you know, sometimes it is very difficult to visualize that how wise a humanity could be, you know, legally as well as morally. OK, to think about uh, the space environment. Uh, but, sir, here the question again is coming back to, you know, the legal aspects of uh, a space environment. You know, uh, as we know that uh, space law is uh, still standing on a very slippery ground. Right. And uh, there is no clear cut directions. They have not. Uh, they have no clear cut. Uh, you know, principles laid down. When it comes to uh, the principle of common heritage of mankind. So, don't you think that actually, you know, the country, the space-faring nation, especially the traditional space-faring nations like USA, uh, you know, and then Russia and all those European space agencies and the NASA and all, they should come together and form a common minimum program to form a policy. Uh, to take an initiative to clean the space chunks because ultimately that is going to uh, environmental concerns are there but that is going to affect our progress also you know so just want to know what do you think about it you know all the organizations coming together and forming a common minimum program could you summarize the question again because it was kind of you know disturbed acoustically oh okay my question is that when we speak about the international space law yeah. Right. We all know that international space law is standing on a very slippery ground. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, there are no clear cut principles. And even if there are clear cut principles, uh, you know, expressed on the paper, there is no proper implementations. There, there is no proper accountability also. And we, we all are OK. Those who are teaching international law, practicing international law are very well aware of it. Now here, when the question of international uh, space environment concern comes, Right. And as you rightly mentioned that uh, the question of funding is there, question of technology may not be there. Right. Then why not the traditional space faring nations like Russia, like the United States, European Space Agency, NASA, they should come together and form a common minimum program to initiate the space cleaning drive. Why is it not possible? Thank you very much. So far, you have seen that there is already this club that came up with the Space Debris Mitigation Guidelines. Right, sir. But what is... However, however, um, this goes very slowly, step by step. The point really is that any part of remediation costs so much money. And nobody wants to be the only country doing it. And I believe also outer space is far away. It is not so pressing for many people as our problems on Earth would be. So uh, very unfortunately, this is not a question of priority for the international community. That's, that's really sad to know. I mean, concerning yes, the human is. ambitions. Yes, it is. Yeah. I mean, concerning the human ambitions, it is really sad to observe. Uh, sir, uh, that yes. is even short-sighted. It's very right, right. short -sighted. Indeed. indeed, indeed, sir. Uh, uh, I had a discussion, I remember, with uh, Professor V.S. Mani when we were discussing about uh, the, the prospects for India okay, as a space-faring nation. And uh, we ha I remember we had a long discussion on it. And his concern was also the same, that whether the Indian policymakers are willing to take the responsibility, you know, that is very important. Yeah. 
you're opening up you're opening up the sector that is possible the private players will be entering right but what about the question of regulations you absolutely know? absolutely absolutely right. is there a last question because i have another meeting to go to yes so sir one last question one last limited question. yeah sure sir one last question and we will conclude so the question is uh, from dr rimmay longway has asked the hod of political science uh, sir we came to know about ufo sightings from time to time the question is ufo or space debris are these ufos contributing to space junk problem <laughs> 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 now no. now you see how would you take it <laughs> <laughs> you you mean ufo yeah it's oh. ufo unidentified object so he is uh, hypothesizing that you know, ufo's are contributing to the space jet problem question. very good question very good question um well you know probably well we say the definition for space debris is that this thing is non functional so you may ask yourself whether a ufo is still functional and uh, um i think the common opinion is that it is and that it brings even people from you know from you know other other stars and other other worlds to us um so um i would be hesitant to um bring in uh, to to list you ufo's under space debris i must say um but i'm very grateful and i will give it further consideration sir thanks very much for that one thank you thank you so much sir uh, there are no more questions and definitely you have channelized the psychology of the people the minds of people people would be more interested in talking about the space law thinking about the space and yes uh, as uh, karl sagan has rightly mentioned our next destination is beyond the galaxy in the space our final home is not the earth we have to go beyond thank you sir thank you so much for your time for your knowledge and most importantly I, this is this is an area where uh, you know people are not willing to talk because people have no idea about you know this part uh, of the knowledge right and our nagaland university has been very kind to include international law in our syllabus in the 6th semester of ba political science as well as at the ma level we have international law and we have space law in the syllabus as well so our students have uh, Oh, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm extremely grateful. Thank you very much for this invitation. I have seen from this very, very vivid uh, discussion that there is a lot of interest and talent in your school. So I'm looking forward to really to visit you. We keep contact. You can distribute my presentation if you are interested in that, and you can write to me as well on my. an email address uh, uh, so well i'm open uh, and i'm very i think uh, you do your step forward and i hope that the time comes when the covid uh, uh, is uh, kind of you know considerably less about us that i can visit then i come from gujarat first or delhi gujarat and then i come to 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 uh, to your college i will in nagaland and maybe again over um over about uh, about uh, space debris and maybe i have then better news than today thank you very much sure, nice sure sir thank you thank you thank you so much bye sir bye. have a great time yep bye see bye. you sir thank you yeah we'll keep in touch uh i i really thankful to all of you on behalf of department of political science tetso college uh, for giving your precious time thank you so much have a great evening ahead thank you so much all of you